Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. So, Daniel, I told you how when we were talking about the Batman, I was disappointed that Riddler was not named Edward Nigma, and it was just Edward Nashton, which is definitely the new way to call him. Remember how I told you that? I do remember that, yeah. I never knew I would also be disappointed that two children were not named Not My Child and Not My Lover. Um, <laughs> I had but here the we are, exact living same that. thought. I was like, you this did. movie better end when he has a bunch of kids and they all have like a terrible name. So <laughs> that don't make, even make sense in the context of this particular story. But I was, I, she's not named Gomer. That got me the whole time. <laughs> and there's a whole thing about her real name. And I was like waiting for it the whole time. I was like, Gomer. My name's not Angel. It's Gomer. Gomer <laughs> would have like, been great. Cause it's like, or she could be Abigail Gomer or something. Cause of the naming convention of. Michael Hosea, Michael Hosea <laughs> which they wisely only said once. Oh, like, it's so like, funny! It's so yeah, funny. Uh, so i I wanted to de- describe this film in a particularly strange way, and we'll of course, you know, explain redeeming love in a minute or two. But like, uh, I work retail. I love it. It's great. It's because I'm a people person. I like to communicate with strangers. Uh, I feel like I'm the exact opposite of Daniel to that. <laughs> I like people. Daniel doesn't. So I like know. people. Ah, got him. I like people um, in doses. I uh, I find if people are made in the image of God, then the more I'm around people, the more I'm around the image of God, and I think that's really wonderful. Uh, I guess my theology is in practice is better than yours, Daniel. Um, it's a weird thing to say, <laughs> Christian podcast. <laughs> yeah, the second you turn theology and Christianity into competition, your theology immediately erodes <laughs> because it's not about competition. You can't compete in sanctification. That's silly. Um, but I work retail, and I love uh, I love the environment. But every now and then, you have a customer who comes in, and they're just skeevy and weird, and like really awkward and i'm in a man- management position so when i see that one of my employees a specifically female ones are uh on the clock sometimes these customers come in and it is important for me to be aware of what's going on so uh, i saw that this older man big guy twice my size not in terms of muscle uh like or in, in terms of muscle not in terms of fat he was a big intimidating guy and he's got a loud voice. And he's super boisterous. And he's talking to this, uh, probably the youngest looking employee at my job. And he's asking for help, looking for this and that, whatever. And I'm just watching because I could tell like, all right, I'm sure she's very uncomfortable. But I know she's good at sales. So she'll be able to coordinate out of this uncomfortable situation and probably make some extra money out of it. So... Uh, but that doesn't happen. And then the guy looks at me and goes, are you watching her? And I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm her boss. So I just want to make sure she's doing OK. Um, and then I'm like doing another job. And he leans in and whispers to her, I think he likes you, which immediately makes me go, uh, that's not that's not good. And of course, I could see that she was very uncomfortable. So I'm watching his eyes because I want to make sure he's not looking in the wrong way. Um, I then go do some other stuff. 
he keeps kind of talking to her and getting close to her. And so I was about to like break it up, just be like, hey, can you do something else for me? And then try and pull that person out of the situation so that uh, I can take over the interaction. At some point, though, my boss shows up too and starts standing near this coworker to make sure that they're safe. Um, and then at some point, as this guy buys what he's buying, which was only one item, so it was a total waste of time in terms of sales, uh, he then keeps talking, asking questions, and then goes, am I making you guys uncomfortable? And I think... I, I didn't hear how my coworkers responded. I know if I was there, I would have probably just said, yeah, I'm pretty uncomfortable, but whatever. Like, I can still sell to you. Like, it doesn't matter. I can still help you. Uh, he leaves. So why do I bring this up? Because that's what redeeming love felt like <laughs> to me, where there are things I like about the thing that I'm participating in. Like, there are a couple scenes that, like, delude me into thinking that this movie was comfortable. Um, mostly in the middle of the film, but there, then the movie like does what it does, which is the equivalent of this customer talking and reminds me of what makes me so uncomfortable about it. And it just kept happening and happening, but it almost felt self-aware of the fact that it was making me uncomfortable. Like the guy going, am I making you uncomfortable? As if that's a power play or whispering to a coworker who likes you, even though they know I'm married and uh, it's also just not good <laughs> for there to be any implication that a manager has any feelings for a coworker. Um, th- this movie felt like it was like David Ayer White winking at me going, am I making you uncomfortable? This is a real movie. Like this is a real movie. Uh, he's a producer, not director, but still. Uh, and it's just awkward and it's awkward for like 60, like a whole hour. Uh, this movie is two hours and 14 minutes. Um, and then it levels out, but then it would just like keep punching you in the arm and going, I'm awkward. And that's my experience with this movie. I even like, I watched it for like 40 minutes on my phone while doing like chores around the house. Cause I am the guy who, when it's a new year, since so 2022, I just want to watch 2022 movies and start building up my ranked list for this year. So when I saw this was put on Peacock, I was like, Hey, <laughs> Daniel told me about this one. Cause it's got a weird, <laughs> Well, it's just weird, which we'll definitely get into the specifics of it. So I was like, yeah, I'll watch that (laughs) because why not? It's 2022. I need to populate this ranked list. And I just like, it was just the strangest thing. Um, And then at some point I was like, well, I got to watch this for the podcast and stop playing Batman games because I've been playing the Arkham games. And it it was really hard to peel myself away from that. It was like 830 last night. And I'm like, I have to finish this movie for the recording today. and I'm like, Kat, you want to watch this movie with me? And uh, Daniel, I just want you to guess at what point. Uh, first off, I'm going to say I don't care about spoilers talking about this movie. Do you? Like, does this matter? Uh, that's we're only a seven question. minutes in. Um, that's a great question because it's there's I don't know spoilers for this movie is a little weird because the plot is so. Um, transgressive, and I think everyone would well, know the plot line and, tra- and its transgression before going. I was to say threadbare because well, that too. the basic beats of the story are broadly the strokes of, of the story of Jose and Gomer, and it's also oh, based on a, we based are on a talking book. Very broad, um, we're talking very bird's eye, based on a relatively popular book. So, I mean, we I we can still have a spoiler section, quote unquote, but I mean. Like, well, guess, then we'll call this backstory, so it's not spoiler. Yeah. Um, but I had I had stopped moving the watching the movie about 38 minutes in when I was doing chores. That was about two weeks ago. So last night when I pressed play, the very first scene I get is a character holding a gun to his head and killing himself. Oh, and I, I just cackled and go, Catherine, you got to come see. <laughs> She's like, what? And I like rewound it. <laughs> I was like... This is this is what a this is what it's like having a movie podcast. We <laughs> have to talk right. about some movie during some week to fill the week because that's kind of what this is right now. We didn't really know what to do, so we were like, "Ah, let's do that one movie. Maybe we'll get clicks on it." And the first thing I see is a character like sniffling with like snot pouring from his nose, and he's just like, <laughs> and he, <laughs> "It was so funny." Oh my gosh, and Kat's like, well, I gotta watch this. So she sits down next to me. And it's uh so that's what I press play and I kept watching. That uh do I sound like a madman for cackling? A, a little bit, especially out of context. 
That's what in, makes it in better. In context, it is. It's funnier in it's context. In, in context, <laughs> it's funnier because of the editing and the choicing. Uh, just it was. It was so. This that sequence was so strange. <laughs> I didn't find it funny because I was just so. It was taking me a sec. It was taking a second for everything to settle in. Um, and it kind of in microcosm is, I think, one of the problems with the movie. I don't think I had as. I was kind of more. Overall, my reaction to the movie was just mixed across the board about everything because it felt like this really uncomfortable marriage of the sacred and secular in a way that I don't know if it pays off because it it felt like the movie was really trying to have his cake and eat it too, 82 in regards to being a quote unquote faith based film, but also wanted to just be like a big sweeping romantic drama. And I really don't think it pulls that off. While also trying to be like, kind of like a lurid, like thing. It's 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 such a strange, strange movie for so many reasons. Which yes, it really is. Uh, I I wasn't as I think you you were texting me periodically watching it like this movie's crazy. This movie's crazy, and also from what I heard from other people, I think I expected something a little more intense based on what everyone's describing. And I think I was a little, I was so, because of that, I wasn't as shocked by how, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's transgressive, but it, parts of it are borderline, dare I say, exploitive. Um, yes. Just because yes. of, and I think here we need to have a little side tangent about, like, based on movies that we have mentioned in passing or based on things we've recommended, like, neither you and I are not prudes i you definitely are a little more sensitive towards certain subject matter than i am but we've seen our fair share of everything in every particular genre i have watched and you have watched the neon demon this is like <laughs> reverse neon demon where instead of having the last 20 minutes be your most transgressive content you've ever seen this movie it's like the first 40 minutes it's like just one that is the most thing. surprising thing to me is the first like hour of this movie is like weirdly violence against women which is never like it is weird yeah, how that's but... always objectively more comfortable than violence against men but like Catherine was just like does the writer hate this character because they're just <laughs> one terrible well, thing I, after another <laughs> i do have a comment about that which i'll get into uh... in a second but like but it's also just the type of violence because if this was a movie like the opening of the movie was Abigail is like a pit fighter <laughs> or something, which is like what we see with guys. That's there's That's a level dope. of balance and they'd be <laughs> sick, but it, but like in theory, she'd also be fighting other women. And so there's like a balance to that or like a guy who's on a battlefield versus this movie. She's just getting like hit and dunked in a tank and like all this like weird stuff that like she is just clearly a victim of what's happening to her, which is just uncomfortable. I mean, that's the intention, but it is uncomfortable to watch. But, um, but like, content needs a context and so in the context of a like horror film or a movie that is by being transgressive this could be transgressive there's certain things that just go down easier and in the context of both a faith-based movie and also a movie that is about love specifically redemptive love the movie does seem to have a weird fixation for half its running time of like treating this our main character very poorly which you could argue is a little accuracy because i mean that's what the abuse the abusive sex trade is like but it doesn't seem to serve kind of the overall purpose of the story to try and tell because you could very easily get the point across doing something else which and I save think, yourself 30 minutes of your runtime holy cow which is this movie's over two hours long which I did not realize when I sat down to start watching it because I assumed this would be like a 90 minute film because it's a faith based movie based on three chapters of a minor prophet with one of the chapters being like eight verses. So, and and half of it like, is the names of their children and yeah. prophecies about Israel, even within that. So, there's a lot you can fill in the blanks with. So, I think at this point, it's important to sort of get into a little bit about the actual kind of plot line. Well, what is this about? the backstory for those who are not aware, this is written. This is based on a book written by Francine Rivers, who was a former romance novelist. She wrote, you know, the uh, those paperback novels that you see at the checkout at the grocery store or whatever. And then she got saved. And then from there, she wrote um, more Christian literature. And so specifically, Redeeming Love is a book she wrote based on the story of Hosea, which she wrote partially as an allegory for her own conversion experience. 
where she was writing about her past with what she felt was sordid material that she was now ashamed of. And this was part of her reflection of how God rescued her. And she also wrote the, as best I can tell, she wrote the first draft of the screenplay and a bunch of faith-based she does companies. Have, yeah, she does have a screenplay credit. Yeah. Um, and a bunch of faith-based companies got the production rights. But then um, everything, the movie was given in the hands of one DJ Caruso, who also rewrote her screenplay. Now, for those of you who do not know, DJ Caruso, if you quickly glance at reviews of the film, which are not positive from a critical standpoint, which I wasn't even aware of till yesterday because I realized like, hey, I don't even know who <laughs> wrote. I don't know how people feel about this movie. Letterbox has some very interesting thoughts, but what? where did you see critic? Where did you see reviews? Um, I tried not to read reviews about it because I, I I was trying my best to go to this movie as fresh as possible. Because for those uh, who, of course, of course, for those who are not aware, my I did not know about this book because it's just not my genre. But I saw a trailer for this movie before I saw the movie Dune, and if for anyone who's seen the trailer knows that the trailer there is no indication in any form that this is a faith based Christian film, let alone a movie based on the story of Hosea. However. There's just something about Christian films where you can just tell. Call I don't know, it, man. I just yeah. I was sitting there and I was watching. And I was seeing, <laughs> I was waiting for the movie Dune to play, and the trailer of this movie plays. And I turn to my friend. And I, t- I I tell him, I think that was a trailer for a sexy Christian movie. And he's like, well, what? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think that's supposed to be a Christian film. And from there, I learned about this. So, but every review, if you look at the blurbs, they'll mention DJ Caruso. Who directed Triple X 3, The Return of Xander Cage, which is <laughs> is true. He directed the insane Triple X 3, which is almost crossed the line into being one of those trashy action movies I can recommend because it's so ridiculous. However, that's not indicative of what the type of movies he makes. If you actually look at his filmography, he directed the 2007 Disturbia remake, which is weirdly well-seen popular film. He directed the movie Eagle Eye and perhaps most importantly he directed the infamous 2014 film the disappointments room which you probably haven't seen but you may know from its appearances on multiple bad movie podcasts and youtube shows and those are kind of lurid sultry uh grimy um thriller films that's what he does that's like his bread and butter and and this year he also had a daily wire movie called shut in uh, oh, he did shot in. So okay. him, yes. Oh <laughs> uh, wow, what a weird career! I don't understand this person's career at all because he's done like those are big movies. Like these are bit like Triple X Three was like a massive co-production of an American and Chinese company. It was a big worldwide like hit. Um, but so I don't know why why he's doing these suddenly, and I do not know where his heart lies. I do not know if he knows the Lord, but his bread and butter is definitely similar material but from an extremely different viewpoint from those who are perhaps working behind the scenes and this really feels like a not 100 percent successful marriage of the sacred and secular where all the people on set as best i know are not believers dj caruso is either not a believer or so much of his experience is with a different type of film and also it is worth noting he as a man He understands the male gaze a lot better than the female gaze, not to get in that perspective, but like the way he shoots in films, particularly prostitutes, isn't necessarily the most edifying thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think this weird mixture of elements is what creates a movie that looks good. This was shot in South Africa. This is not green screen. It looks okay. Yeah. Especially if you are used to a lot of recent superhero films, which is a big topic on Twitter right now. This is just how much of like Spider-Man No Way Home was shot with green screen, where even basic things like buildings and streets are green screened in. Yes. This certainly stands out. All of the acting with one specific exception is really good. Like there are some actor actors show up. Um, the woman who plays the Duchess, you may if she sounds, looks familiar, that's Famke Jansen, who was Jean Grey in all the X-Men movies, Logan Marshall Green upgrade himself shows up for about 20 minutes. Um, Abigail Cohen continues our streak of reviewing movies with people who are in Sabrina, the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Uh, she and she's currently in that Winx Club show on Netflix. She's quite good given the material she's given. Jamie so Lee some... O'Donnell's from Dairy Girls. Yes. Didn't know. <laughs> she shows up for like a few scenes as yes. comedy person uh, with her wonderful accent. And 
so there's a lot of talent here. I just don't know if they necessarily match the material, uh, which at this point, do you want me to introduce the basic plot? <sighs> you can give it a try. <laughs> you can give it a try. <laughs> Hey there, it's your friendly neighborhood call to action. Just checking in on you. Hope you're doing all right. I'm just stopping by to say, you know, if you enjoy the show, you can always subscribe and write a review for Cinematic Doctrine. There's iTunes, Podchaser, basically anywhere you listen. You can give us a shout out with a thumbs up, five stars, gripping positivity. Or if you hate the show, you can say that too. Hey, what? What are you saying? Why are you saying that? Well, I'm not going to tell them what to do, Ted. They're free to do what they want. Our analytics say we got a lot of listeners in the U.S., and you know they love their freedoms. And you're also free to check out our Twitter. Very active there. We host polls, memes. There's also the Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group called Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group. If you want to join, just answer the questions, read the rules, and tell them the podcast sent you. Also, you should check out our website. Some really cool stuff there. Editorials, written reviews for movies we haven't had time to cover. Always check out cinematicdoctrine.com when you get the chance. Oh, uh, Ted also told me I shouldn't forget to mention the Patreon. Something about you can support us or something? Wait, Ted, I thought this was like a hobby thing. You want me to... expand Cinematic Doctrine. You know this Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I forgot. I'm the one who put all this together. Yeah, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you can gain access to early uncut episodes of the podcast. Oh, and did I mention, you get to tell us what to do. That's right, each month you get to vote on a movie we discuss on the show. Anyways, I gotta run, so I'll see you guys later. So for for those of you who have not read the book of Hosea... Uh, <laughs> I don't. I do not even. I'm just gonna say it. I don't think comparisons to Hosea make any sense, even ter- in terms of inspiration. I uh, I don't even like it. Uh, <laughs> I will. I will. I will lightly disagree for reasons that we will. I'm sure get into as we go through the movie. Because the I will say like yeah, it deviates quite a bit from the quote unquote plot of the Book of Hosea. But that is part of my what is so bizarre about the movie to me, oh, which is I agree. that I agree. It's, the the plot of Hosea, the sacred scripture, is <laughs> God tells Hosea to marry. And I'll read from the NASB because the King James uh, uses even harsher language. Um, but Lord spoke to him, go take to, uh, to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry for land commits flagrant harlotry forsaking the Lord. I believe the King James says like whoredom, I think. Is yeah, the word I've heard but, uh, interpretations of, of two sides. One that he specifically marries someone who already is a prostitute or that the implication is you're going to marry someone who is a prostitute and you don't necessarily know it. Either way, it doesn't necessarily change the text, in, in my opinion, in terms of what is the purpose of the, the narrative. But uh in this they definitely go full swing which is <laughs> well yeah i think it's just the, it's very interesting i think yeah i think con- the conventional interpretation is he marries a uh prostitute mm-hmm. and then she is unfaithful but then um you know she goes back to Hosea, and it's a whole th- is representative of israel's relationship with the lord and how they're unfaithful to him but god is still faithful to them right and so on and so forth and there's not much story there, but it has become, and this is not unique to Redeeming Love. The, Jose and Gomer has become a very popular uh, subject of reinterpretations. There is uh, uh, the head of the um, music department at my Bible college wrote a play based on the story of Hosea. Uh, I've met multiple people who, for them, this particular uh, part of scripture really speaks to them because of the way that they faltered and struggled and so forth. So it has become a popular focal point for people to do art uh, as far as based on scripture. And I have not read Redeeming Love. I do not know how faithful to the book it is. I've heard universally people who, don't, who have seen and read, so who are familiar with both, will say the book is much better. Uh, I mean, that's every single movie based on a book. <laughs> but uh, Redeeming Love is takes the story of Jose and transports plants it to the gold rush uh we are we see two characters we see abigail cohen uh playing a character named angel and she is the child of a of an adulterous relationship 
whose father is just <laughs> the worst person in the world and openly talks about how much he, he hates her daughter, his daughter doesn't care for her, uh, which begins her belief that uh, love is not real and so on and so forth. Once her mother dies, who is, appears to be a somewhat faithful woman, uh, he sells her into prostitution and where he then immediately gets horribly murdered in front of her. Um, and then as part of her, she becomes a prostitute. And then Wait, for who got murdered in front of her? The dad? Was that her dad? No. Is it? It's no, 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 it's not her dad. It's some other guy. Sorry. It's just some, because, it's just some other guy. Yeah, because, and that's important because her dad right. does show up later. Uh, important uh, <laughs> thing, which I'll, I think we'll save uh, that bit. Um, and so she is a the most popular prostitute in all the land. Uh, all the other prostitutes talk about how she's the best prostitute. And uh, however, while this is happening, uh, Tom Lewis, who has no other credits on Wikipedia, on IMDb, he was a voice in an Assassin's Creed game, and he made a few appearances in some obscure television shows. But for all intents and purposes, this is his big acting debut. Yeah, he plays Michael Hosea, who uh, is supposed to be Hosea for those who didn't pick that up. And he is just a great guy. And that is his character for the rest of the movie. Boy, yes. is he a great uh, guy. He is on a farm. He is doing a Matthew McConaughey impression. He prays to the Lord, asking that he provides her a wife. And of course, upon seeing Angel while in town, he says, that's the woman for me. And he begins to try and woo her by showing up and saying, we should get married. And she says no. And eventually her, she changes her mind after getting viciously beaten. And uh, from there, she says she ain't much for wife material. And uh, then she runs off with Logan Marshall Green at one point and goes back into prostitution. Then she leaves again. Then they have a nice life. And then she <laughs> leaves again. And which... At that point, the movie does provide what I think is one of the one of the only interesting story twists that they could. And then the movie wraps up where she re returns to Hosea, who has been waiting for her to return this whole time. And they're married. And if that doesn't sound like much plot, uh, that's because it really isn't. However, this takes over two hours to do. Oh, man. It's and most of that in the interim, in theory, uh, would be character development where you see them fall in love and learn to cherish and care for one another. However, weirdly no one really gets a character of any kind everyone just kind of serves the purpose in the story like michael hosea is just a, the perfect man he is just a perfect human being for all for most part uh occasionally he gets upset he punches logan marshall green he says something bad about abigail he has a short 15 second extremely awkward action scene where he rescues her from a brothel. Since I since I have been doing nothing but playing the Batman games when he does all that stuff, I'm like, ah, why, press Y, why? press Y. <laughs> press Y and B and you can do the instant takedown. <laughs> <laughs> if he'd done the, the arm breaking thing, that'd have been sick. Um, <laughs> it's so cool. It's like the first fight scene in the Watchmen movie where it just comes out of nowhere and like Owl Man just splits people's arms open. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> he should have done the thing where he throws a guy through a window. And, yeah. <laughs> and then the the smiley faces on the ground um yeah no one gets much to do because they're they simultaneously they're serving the purpose of just playing out the beats of the story but also they're not really important as people they're more important as representatives in an allegory however that might work in a more like artistic film art, yeah in a like slow terrence malicky every it's about the mood and Man, vibe i was thinking of, of a hidden life every now and then but even that has deeper characters yeah like if if there was like shots of her walking through a field as someone monologue scripture over it or something that might be really neat but this is also supposed to play out like almost like a lifetime movie where the drama of can these two people coexist can they fall in love but that all kind of just happens without any struggle of any kind, except for the parts where she runs away. And so it just it's this uncomfortable mixture of elements that for me never quite comes together. There's a handful of things that work by virtue of the source material is you cannot fully divorce it from what it's what these characters are supposed to represent. It is almost impossible. So at the end of the film, spoilers, where she returns to Hosea and it's clear that he's been waiting for her the whole time. And he still loves her after all of these things and how he never remarried because God is faithful. That is that's nice. But it's also not the movie didn't do that. Right. That is they didn't write the Bible. They didn't write the book of Hosea that right. already exists. And while I can see elements also of 
you know, the author's own story of faith in there as well. Again, like that's not something you can really credit the movie with because every person I've talked to or any positive reviews I've read talk about how it's an amazing story, but they're not talking about the story in the movie as much as I think they think they are. They're talking about the wonderful picture of God's unfailing grace for his people, regardless of what they do, regardless of how far they run away, how much they actively try and live against him, how much they commit adultery against the Lord, he is still faithful. That is beautiful. And the few moments for that, that sort of peeks through in the movie, that's good stuff. But that is maybe five to 10 minutes of a two hour, five minute runtime plus 15 minutes of opening and closing credits. Like, and I cannot fully give the movie credit for that and there's some nice sort of movie things throughout it where like like the locations they picked were nice some of the acting is really good almost in spite of the material yeah specifically abigail cohen who really That's is good. a great screen presence there's a scene where she, there's like a handful of scenes where you should do something other than cry and get hit she's great like there's a scene where she's trying to get a dog to stop following her there's a handful of scenes there's like a five minute sequence where she's on the farm learning to farm things. And I was like, yes, the movie has started. Yeah. If the rest of the movie is right. here, we have something. And then she just immediately ditches, which again, the poster there's the, so the poster of the movie is like, it's like two characters holding each other, but in the film you find out it's actually them having sex on the field. Oh my gosh. Which is pretty funny. Yeah. They're having sex on this poster. I, I, I yelled at, I yelled out loud. I pointed at the screen and I'm like, cat, that's the poster. And he's like, what? I'm like, they're having sex on the poster. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but, oh my um, gosh. And it's crazy. That but, is his own side conversation, which we will but then, inevitably have to talk about. But so I, I and was like that fan, scene but. happens and like they're like happy. And then it shows her and this is the second time. So it's comical. It shows her putting the ring down on this table and then leaving. So I laughed because I was like, it's just funny. Like there is it was it was a punchline. The way it's edited, the way it's set up, the way the narrative's written, like it was like everything was OK. And then it's like, just kidding. <laughs> like, I just, I don't know. Like, I this movie has some strange editing, man. I feel like whoever was editing it recognized, like, we need, there needs to be more breathing room. There can't just be, like, this hard cut between, like, this really romantic scene. Like, even the reason they're on the field is because, like, it's, she's never enjoyed or noticed, like, things that are beautiful before because she's always been so depressed and sad and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then she just leaves. <laughs> it's just so silly, dude. And if uh, if you just wrote out the outline, there again, there's some story because it like she leaves three times uh, throughout the movie. The first time she leaves, it's because she doesn't think she's worthy of being loved. The second time she leaves, it's because she's scared of the love that she and um, Michael Hosea have. And the third time she leaves is because she just doesn't think she's good enough for him, particularly because she's incapable of having children because of something horrific that happened to her. And these, there's some thought there put to the structure. And that I think that's probably a remnant of uh, Francine Rivers' stuff where these are, this, this could form an interesting sort of story outline for somebody's struggle with God, right? Where someone who comes to the Lord and at first they resist coming to God because they don't think they're worthy of God's love or forgiveness. And then once they get close to God, they're then afraid of God. They're afraid of his love, or they're just so aware of how much they fall short of the glory of God. And then that causes them to pull away. And then later they just, they love God and they realize that God loves them, but there's something inside that says they're not worthy still. And they think that whatever, you know, there's something there, but again, the way it plays out in the movie it's, it's so weird and, and kind of funny. Weird. Yeah. And yeah, occasionally it's just, yeah, it's awkward. There's one extremely awkward thing to the end of the movie. Um, and I think for the most part, there's two main things that are going to be sticking points for people. And I think the first is the actual level of content. To be clear, this is a PG 13 film. So if you have watched any remotely sensual drama in your life, you've if you've watched seen the worse. notebook, another PG 13 film, <laughs> Uh, you've seen this movie and actually uh, this movie has more nudity, I think, than the notebook. It has notebook very has side boob nudity. and I'm pretty yeah. sure you see her whole breast, but it's only like one scene. Whereas in this, it's like, uh, 
it's there's extended it's sequences where she is for all intents and purposes naked however she's also is an anime disney princess so her long bron- blonde locks are just like covering everything they, it's called convenient censoring where things in the foreground just happen to cover whatever is considered like an uh, austin powers gag yeah um, <laughs> yeah yeah which you know i think it's worth mentioning and talking about a little bit where for different people, this will be different levels of comfortability. There is an argument that it is for accuracy. Because, yeah, if you showed up at brothel and walked into Prostitute's room, they're not going to be wearing like a three-piece suit or something, you know, like <laughs> whatever. But, you know, for the in the context of the film, it, it makes sense. But also given the... But the in the context of the metatextual nature of the film, and, which is it's a biblical story, the audience is Christian-based, it's PG-13, um, which... Almost exclusively, I'm sure, was picked because if they were rated R, it wouldn't get as big an audience well, and make as much it, money. Again, it, it wouldn't feels need to like... be rated R, but it's like it's it's targeting an audience. But then, like, I I really actually thought it was only going to be the one initial scene when Michael walks in. It's the first time he's going into the brothel, and then she's like naked, and it's censored uh, cleverly so they don't have to just do black bars or something silly or what is it in uh disney plus when they censored what's the movie swim or something where it's yes. tom hanks yeah and like they just edited her hair to be longer to cover her butt it's so funny looking but uh that scene she's naked kind of the whole time then she covers up whatever but then like more of the movie goes on and like there's just more scenes where she's either naked or topless or it's visually sensual which isn't necessarily wrong all the time but it's weird in the context of the demographic and purpose of the film yeah um, which is where i think when you're describing this marriage of sacred and secular starts to come together where it's like something doesn't feel quite yes right something feels a little off and this type of thing does not bother me like it whatever it's it's literally a movie where half the movie's set a brothel but why do they make the decision to set half the movie at a brothel and it, again, it feels like this thing where all of the producers of the film are Christian faith-based companies, and Francie Rivers is has and a guy named group. Michael Scott. Is it really? Do that. Oh it yeah, a guy, the producer <laughs> Michael Scott and David R. White. Yeah, David R. White. It feels like they were like, "Hey, we want to." Either they were like, "This has to be PG-13," and that was it. And he was like, "Okay." And so Caruso was like, did as much as he could with the comments PG-13, or they were like, "You can't, you can do this, you can't do this." Not understanding that, like, maybe for the people on set, they're just trying to hit a limit because they're not thinking in terms of, like, moral or ethical. They're not thinking in terms of, like, okay, as Christians, we feel like doing X, Y, and Z is inappropriate. So we're going to do our best to honor this. We're going to do our best to present people a ceremony. We're going to do our best not to put stumbling blocks out there, et cetera, et cetera. While somebody who's just been given, like studio notes, essentially, is going to be like, okay, the studio says we can and can't do this. And they're just going to work in those confines. Like, again, I don't have insider information or anything, but that's what it feels like to me, where somebody just said, we're doing a Christian movie, so you can't do this, you can show this, you can't show this. And he just did as much as he was allowed to do, which comes off potentially kind of weird. And then from there, you get into some of just the events of the movie where it's almost Christian misery porn at a certain point where yeah. it's like, okay, you can just have her be a prostitute and then imply things in her backstory. And it's the same story. Like you don't need to have it where her father actively hates her. Her mother died tragically of movie illness. Um, a guy gets murdered in front of her. And then in an extremely bizarre sequence of events, they just do the twist from old boy in the middle of the movie yeah and yeah yeah there is a scene where her her biological father shows the brothel knowingly she gets him as a client and when he finds out what he's done he shoots himself and this happens like immediately one after another which is why it was so funny to me (laughs) it's like it's this insane insane twist to throw in the middle of the movie Uh, if i saw this in theaters dude i would have got i was i was aghast i could not believe what happened and then it's never brought up they're implying that she's working as a prostitute as a child 
and then it builds yes, up into which, this climax of having sex with their dad. And it's just You could do weird. that because that's the thing that happens. Like women are sold into the into the sex industry all the time. And it's sad and it's tragic. Right. You could do it, but it just is weird in this movie. Well but why did you add and we're gonna write this into the movie too? I in your two hour and fourteen minutes. This might have been something that happened. That's crazy. I don't know anything about Francine Rivers. I don't know her story. I don't know her testimony. I don't know if she's drawing on personal trauma in her life and put that in the movie. Um, If that is the case, then, you know, praise God that he's brought her through this. But just as someone who doesn't know anything about her and I doesn't know anything about anyone involved in the production of this movie, it is a weird thing, not just to include, but to also completely never mention or touch again, because it happens maybe 30 seconds of screen time total that this sequence takes place. And then it's never brought up again. It's never reckoned with. It's just a thing that happens in a series of miserable things where uh, it, it, at one point she gets pregnant and they like forcibly, um, what's her like for? They like force her abortion and make it where she can't have children anymore. She gets beaten horribly. She gets beaten by someone who works at the brothel when she asks for her money back so she can go and live her own life. And she gets, she gets punched by other women in a scene that uncomfortably reminded me of a scene in Nicolas Cage Wicker Man where he walks up to someone dressed in a bear costume and hits somebody. You know what scene <laughs> I'm talking about? That happens in this movie, basically, where two uh, other women just walk up and punch her in the face as she's trying to get on a boat and leave. It's just one miserable scene after another. It is not good if your movie makes you think of the Nicolas Cage Wicker Man. <laughs> it's just that one because it just it just caught me so off guard. It's like, oh, geez. And then it's just like, why Catherine are you doing this? was like, what? Why is this? What's happening? <laughs> to get and to the editing of the movie, I didn't realize. I was like, is this a flashback? I can't tell. Like, I can't tell if this is a flashback or not because she's the same age. She's either a kid or the age she is currently throughout the entire movie. So there's actually a few scenes where I was entirely sure if what I was seeing was, you know, timeline wise supposed to be now or a few years ago. But it's all these miserable things over and over again. And it's presented so bluntly, but like, neither artfully but without or, tact like because it's tactless, i mentioned yes. earlier but like nicholas winning reffin is a blunt nasty exploitative director but because it's done with this like artistic flair of like knowingly i don't know presentable it becomes more digestible plus you know what you're getting because the movie's rated r and you know it's it's him so it's going to be really violent wild so it just i i really do think like what what's what's killing the film the more we talk about it is the fact that it's supposed to be this Christian targeted demographic. Fo- well, maybe it's a Christian targeted demographic movie since you said the trailer was like hidden Christian, like it wasn't overt spiritual. I don't know. Like, I don't think they mentioned God or anything in the trailer at once. I see I mean, it if more you have than a once. title named redeeming love, my first thought is Christian. Yes. Like, that it's, sounds it's, like, coded like the christian and audience have, will know what it is but and they'll also know like what certain phrases mean too yeah because like throughout the film there are christian phrases and stuff like that well also he like prays to god and michael yeah. why don't you go after her because of free will it's like what what <laughs> just go like <laughs> is that she that she a prophet? refers That's to like you have to go to yeah she refers to like i guess the main tag film she calls him the father of lies at one yeah, point yeah like what and it's like pizza gate oh, is he the <laughs> devil <real. laughs> yeah that's the scene that <laughs> To, to jump ahead a little quick, because we're <laughs> oh, um, dumb. so the one twist that I actually thought was kind of interesting is the third time she leaves, she kind of briefly returns to the world where she's almost going to be like part of a burlesque show, but uh, she starts really she prays, she's like God, like like if you're real, like please help me and that sort of thing, and she gets a vision of like her mother and tells her tell the truth, and she gets up on stage and she goes this man is like a pervert he's you know he's a pedophile he has little girls and he's like what and everyone's just like aghast because i guess that's shocking revelation to them i guess it maybe wasn't as well known i don't know anything about like the history of that time period and prostitution but that's this is like seen as a horrible revelation and she rescues two girls so this idea and then later she runs like a home that's for women in her situation which is a great angle. It's the first time she has agency. It's the first time she's taking control of the situation. She, you see an actual change in her as a person that indicates that she is being transformed and changed by God and by uh, Michael. And it's like, this is some good stuff. It, I wish there was more of this in the movie. But in that sequence where she escapes, she rescues two girls and she's walking out. 
a guy gets up and goes, little girls, there are little girls. And we're just freaking out. <laughs> and I was like, oh. First, first off, the sequence of events is she gets on stage, gives this hor- shocking revelation, then runs to the back, knocks a guy out, grabs these girls. So I guess the audience has just been sitting there going, is another act coming on? What's happening? I paid 20 bucks. <laughs> like, where's right. the rest of the show? Yeah. So I guess yeah. they're just waiting for the rest of the show because the guy also went, oh, that's not true. I don't, I'm not a pedophile. And then he <laughs> runs out and like everyone just starts freaking out. They're like, this is true. There are little girls. It's insane. So they chase down the father of lies. And, um, <laughs> immediate, and at first I'm like, oh, so he's supposed to be a devil. We killed the CEO of, of Satan. Yeah, <laughs> we it's, got him. I, I guess it's the guy's the devil. And then the just know. card cuts to him being hung. Like he's just hanging from a noose. I was like, oh. I guess that's over. I guess they yes. revealed that he's as the soon devil, as it starts, it and ends. then yeah. it's over. It is again. It's like on paper, I could see how this scene could be powerful or whatever, but it's handled so like awkwardly that it doesn't hit the way it's supposed to. And then the subsequent scenes are really nice. Like you see that she's teaching these women how to read and write. Um, uh, upgrade shows up again for a few minutes of screen upgrade. time, <laughs> and he's. <laughs> He's really good in this. It really highlights how not a great actor the Michael Hosea guy is because the 20 minutes this guy on the screen, not only is he just better, he has way more chemistry than Abigail Cohen. Like the scenes where like there's this earlier scene where he shows up and he realizes Michael is married a prostitute and he visibly doesn't like her and the fact that she's wearing his Michael's sister slash his wife's old clothes. Like he's disgusted by this. And when Michael leaves the scene, they have this awesome scene where they're like being snide at each other. He's like trying to like, like slut shamer. And she's like making all these like actually kind of like clever, like comments. He's like, I, you know, I want to rip those clothes right off you. And she's like, Oh, I'm sure you would. And it's like, it's like sassy. And it's like, they have some chemistry and then the guy leaves the movie. But so then they have this other scene where they're making up for this, where he's, you know, because also he like in exchange for giving right back to the brothel, like she has sex with him. And so he has a scene where he's like asking her for forgiveness and he seems genuinely heartbroken by the person that he is and for how wrong he's misjudged her because he sees that she has changed. And this is a really nice scene. And again, this is where this is a few moments where something they've added to the stew here actually enhances what they're trying to do. Or in a more contemporary setting, we're seeing a more grounded, realistic uh, example of both redemption and forgiveness and someone's life being transformed by someone loving someone in a Christ-like way. And it is one scene, and for me, it really, really works. And also the revelation, because when she leaves the last time, she specifically leaves a note in her ring for another woman saying, like, please marry Michael so he can have the children he deserves, he deserves you. And at first she thinks when he talks about how like the woman has a family uh, upgrade, because I can't remember the actor's name, reveals that he has married her and those are his children. And Michael is not remarried. And he's been waiting for his whole time. And it's like beautiful. It's a great little scene. And it's it's the only thing in the movie that I can like be like, yeah, that was really good. And it's like maybe one it's five the last minutes, scene. Minutes, yeah. It's in the last 10 minutes of the movie. And then she comes home. And again, Abel Cohen is just killing it in all these period level clothing. She has like a little umbrella. It's great. And they come and they embrace. And it's lovely. And so. But that's you had nice. to go through an hour it's, and 50 it, minutes to get to that scene you liked. Even longer. It is. Yeah. It is. Because it's the it, they stop just punching this poor woman in the face and they just let her have a character arc, which she doesn't yeah. have for most of the movie. It's really strange. Like there's again, there's a scene early on where she's on the farm and he's teaching her how to get eggs. He's teaching her how to chop wood. And there's like this really charming little moment where she's like, no, no, I can do it. I can do it. And she like tries to cut the wood with an axe. And then like as she's falling backwards, she's like mumbling something about like, oh, that, that wood is just extra firm or something. And it's like a cute, like, this is something an awkward couple doesn't really know each other would do. And then she immediately leaves with yeah. Logan Marshall Green. And it's just like, what? Why? Because th- they're more interested in having her be this archetypical harlot who gets punished for being a harlot and just needs to run back to this guy and who doesn't really do anything other than be super nice. And it's that's two hours of the movie. I I just, it's so befuddling, everything about this to me. I don't know, but. It's a weird movie. Obviously, man. you don't like it. Is there yes. other things? You know? <laughs> so. I do not like it. Uh, the the things I do like are, yeah, the performances pretty much for the most part, fine. 
uh, Tom Lewis as Michael is okay for me. Uh, he's extremely okay. <laughs> yeah. I feel bad. But he doesn't have so a hard. lot to do. No, he's just told he to no smile character. and be say, oh, yeah. shucks. He <laughs> plays know? Jesus from The Chosen. He just <laughs> looks like he's going to cry at all times and he looks happy. Like, that's – it's silly. Except – Except he's not because he he prays and it's a church and there's the Bible. So this man is also clearly not supposed to be, he's supposed to be just a regular guy. He's supposed to be Hosea. So you could just write this guy a character. You could give him flaws. You can make him get mad at people more. Yeah, why you not? You could give these people characters. They just choose not to. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's weird. I This <laughs> this movie really, really draws it out of you. It's <laughs> weird. It's just so weird. It's like because it's like there's nothing that's like really bad. That's the because I was hoping it'd be funny bad or there'd be something really problematic in it. The times that it was funny bad to me is when I really stepped further back from the film to see it as like a film in reality as opposed to just like how we always engage movies, which is to be in their reality. But like the movie's not grimy enough to be fun to be in its reality, um, and it's not dramatic enough to get me engaged in the emotional uh reality so i just was not connected to it in fact after the movie ended and and i was talking with cat about it um like yeah like you started with this we're not prudes we watch stuff that's pretty intense or violent i think i have um a bit more barriers to certain films than you do like even talking about this one like i wasn't too sure about talking about something with forms of nudity in it um but I also felt like it was interesting enough to talk about and worthwhile because it's a Christian film um, to do. Wouldn't that be something where we should, we were like, we can't re- review this Christian film because of the obscene content. Because <laughs> of the obscene. Well, that's actually, I that's kind of why we're doing it. Yeah. Um, which frankly, other Christian movies like God's Not Dead have obscene content. It's just not as, not in the same way. Um, uh, obscenely funny, <laughs> if that's what she mean. <laughs> Bazinga. Um, <laughs> but like, we were talking and I was like, so, so in terms of context for my own life, uh, it's been a couple of weeks since watching the Marvel Netflix shows because they were taken off, but now they're back on and I'll get back to watching uh, well, Punisher they, season one next. moved to Disney Plus. They yes. moved to Disney Plus. Um, and while Iron Fist, yes, is the weakest, it has my favorite plot line, which is uh, the Meachams, Ward Meacham and Joy Meacham and Harold Meacham. You just you I can't love- go 15 minutes. That's like something completely buck wild. I know. No. <laughs> what? You did well, I texted you, it was like Ward's great. The You're like favorite uh, thing of yeah. the Marvel Netflix shows is in Iron Fist. It's must, Ward. Must we include these hot takes? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it's 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 funnier because it's an Iron Fist. That's what makes it great. Because I, I I said this would be great if the if Ward was the protagonist and like Danny Rand was like the antagonist, ruining he's everything. Just, <laughs> he's an annoying he's, like roommate so, that like yeah, ruins yeah. his dates and eats his food. Yeah, because um, he's because it's true. But like <laughs> I, <laughs> but like. Ward as this character goes through just the worst stuff um, and like has great drama to the character and walks in on his dad carving someone's face. It's awesome. And like all that's insane Uh, and extremely, extremely graphic. And then this movie also is insane with transgressive extreme content not extreme but like comparably yeah, i don't want people to think that like we're hyping this up like it's basic instinct or something no 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 no, no 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 not at all it's just within context you, of it being a faith yeah. film it's like, like if you see american horror story you've seen worse but obviously my tolerance for like ex- ex- uh violence and uh the the insane and like um lack of human life or, or lack of human uh um Respect for human life. Like I, I can watch films where that's not <laughs> a thing in it at all at times. So like, why is my tolerance for redeeming love so much lower? And I think it is because like, first off, I, I don't think the film is particularly great anyway. Um, second, it doesn't earn the right to do these things. Yeah, it doesn't earn it. Uh, it's not a slow burn. It's immediate when it tries to be transgressive and violent, but it's also not clever enough to do that. Like, I feel like what's, what's a, satirical violent film i've seen that did oh dead alive we keep can't get away from it every episode <laughs> but like the opening scene is like somebody getting his arms chopped off and head chopped off and it's funny um, or like but it immediately cop like a paul beer <laughs> movie is a sure example. it immediately yeah. tells you what the movie's about um in doing that whereas redeeming love never really 
lets me in on either a joke or lets me in on the drama to enjoy what's happening or to find like like for me i was more frustrated that this actor had to be dunked in a water tank than the character enduring something horrible because for me it's like is it even worth the performance? Like, is this worth getting paid to do right, that for a right, film right. that's not particularly all that great? Same with uh, burying oneself, which there is a debate to be had about like, well, if guys can be topless in public, why not women? Is it a form of sexuality or the way we sexualize each other? I mean, even uh, topless men in public was sort of like, I think the 1930s is when like it became legal and that's because men were like pining for it. Um, so even in terms of like modern social structures, it's, new quote unquote in terms of the last 110 years 100 years it's it's yeah again some of those things were like all of this that we're talking about you could defend it from the point of view of like well but it's like telling this amazing redemptive story and it's not it's but, just not <laughs> but like did it need to be do you first off does you it don't need to be need two to hours? see this movie to get this story, it has been it is based on a book, which you can read, which itself is based on the Bible, which you certainly should read. So the argument that like, well, if we didn't do this, there's no way like the what you need, like the movie needs to do something to kind of justify its own existence in that regard, where it's just like it needs to tell the story in such a way that's so compelling or unique to the medium or unique to the movie itself that you could say, like, you know what? They did some borderline buck wild things, but they told such a compelling story that like makes people want to seek out this God that these characters have been talking about, or it makes someone who has similar experiences to what Abigail uh, Cohen's character is experiencing that we have to sit there and go, you know what? Like there's something to this. Like there's there, the overall package is, is so successful what it's doing that we simply must, you know, we simply must give it a pass for what it's doing. Unfortunately, it just doesn't feel that way. It feels like, a kind of half baked selection of it. it. The fact that it's such a competently well, like made vo- film is part of what makes this so strange. Right. Like, gosh, yes. darn it. This looks like the old West. Like I really appreciated the sets. I really appreciated uh, most of the performances. I liked the costumes a lot. Like as somebody who just appreciates people kind of wearing fun outfits, like I thought yes. it was great that yeah. throughout the whole movie, they just keep putting all these different characters and fun period clothing. And, all like all this veneer of 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 quality and and craft is just going into kind of this what feels like a more intense lifetime movie with a little more scripture sprinkled on it is kind of what it felt like in the end and so it's just like why do we need this and in one on the one hand it is a step forward for faith-based films because it is much more tightly made than so many other christian yes, films I've yes yes this is arguably a a, a fine well-made movie it is up there as i can only imagine <laughs> in terms of pretty darn good christian movies sure but, not as good as case for christ uh i thought that was yeah, much better and, <laughs> and of course there's like borderline christian films everyone throws out there like i know a lot of people who go to bat for like hacksaw ridge you know but sure yeah which is one of the most violent, violent war movies i've ever seen but it's but it's just like why do we need this is kind of my feeling of just it, after watching it i'm like this you could get the same experience a million other ways there's a ton of other you could just read like about annie lobert's story you know who does um i think i think they're called hookers for jesus but she specifically does a ministry to sex workers where she helps bring them out of that world and that sort of thing um like there's so many other ways you get the same story or you could just read the book of hosea or you could just read the novel this is based on because this is the other thing like if you read on paper and they like, and he took her and they made love and as the sun set behind them, there's a level of your own engagement where you can choose how much you engage with that sentence. You can even skim over the words. You can imagine right. whatever you want versus right. just, it's just here on screen. Um, sex is undeniably part of this story. They cannot get out of it. She is a right. prostitute. And part of what you can do is you can contrast like when she has sex with him versus when she's had sex with all these other people. Cause for the first time she's being tenderly loved in a edifying way. Yeah, I thought way about that. I was by... like, there's definitely an artistic way to display the, the kind of love that's being expressed. Yes. The quote redeeming love. When she ends up sleeping with, uh, upgrade, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's almost competitive. It's transactional. they look like they're unhappy. They look like they're unhappy. 
Um, there is a sense of like, and nobody liked it at the end anyway. It's just like, <laughs> she's like, seems, she seems physically she's, ill and regretful for what she's done. And he's just still half in the bag. So like, whatever, but like, yeah. um, yeah, having some sort of display, visual display of, um, uh, and it can be non, uh, abrasive in terms of visual content to express the difference in how this is like, I don't know handled because like they show later that like when she has sex with michael like it zooms on the hands and they're like together and i was like hey art this is art <laughs> they're showing that it's gentle and like they're together um but then like but then they have a second sex scene yeah why why did you do that <laughs> yeah i uh i don't know <laughs> why I is that don't in know. the movie why is that in my christian movie you know it's strange why did they do this i don't i don't understand it's- i was most surprised by the how touchy-feely they were with each other as actors uh in this in my christian movie like in that kind of way like i thought that was a particularly strange choice uh like the we talked about okay. convenient, I, I, there's some, we talked there- about convenient censoring but literally one of the convenient censorings is michael's hand on her breast <laughs> it's, so it's like what it, <laughs> but then like it's they're more so stilted and locked expect. like yeah. the actors were like the director's like now don't move like you have to fall onto the bed but you cannot like yeah. go like, pure fix people will pull out of funding you know, <laughs> like, you know it's um it's silly uh it's strange i don't know it's, i yeah it again it feels there is there is an argument made where there can be a or, there can be a christian version of a um, movies that display normal human sexual behavior but and again, without I'm, it being like object uh, objectifying or lustful right. or even incurring lust upon people, like uh, it's it's possible. It's yeah, I, I it's an it's a weird line for it's it's a weird topic to talk about just because I I don't know if we'll ever come to any sort of consensus as far as this uh, debate goes because some people argue for more permissiveness, and some people argue for more restrict be more restrictive, but. Because the one you can't really tell, there's a lot of stories you really can't tell without addressing one of the most basic universal human experiences that exists, especially one in this such story where it plays such a strong role in her own journey and journey with faith you know, even in this story. So there has to be a way where you can display it. And I just don't know if they necessarily landed that. Like, I don't know if it stuck the landing as far as that like Mm -hmm. goes because there's a couple of things in this movie where i was actually a little surprised they went with it like there's a scene (laughs) there is in any other movie this would be just pure comedy here's just comedy in like an awkward way where i just like i can't believe this is on screen where she's like trying to entice him and he initially is like nope we're not ready for that because you know they're not married yet it's but like he's like we're not ready because she keeps trying but they were married he just was saying like we're not ready for it Yes, because she's still in this mindset where she she's rewarding him for being a nice guy, and like there's a scene where like she sits on his lap and like grabs him, and it, I was just like right. whoa, <laughs> and he right. was like uh, and it was like you know in any other movie I wouldn't be bothered by it, but in this movie it was just it fell out of place, and then she's like seductively on the bed, and he like r- runs into a lake and just starts taking a bath, cooling off, forget about it. It's He's like silly, I gotta take yeah. the dog for a walk. The dog's just like laying there, like half asleep. I was like, this is actually pretty funny. And I kind of wish there was yeah. more stuff in this movie like this because it's just, it is weird, but it is comedy that purely comes out of the character dynamic. This isn't character someone dynamic, writing. It's somewhat realistic in terms of like, if this is what these characters are going to do, let's actually watch them do things that they would do. But I feel like so much of the plot line removes agency from characters. And so they're not actually it's, able to be characters. They have yes. to do certain, like there yes. really is no objective reason why Michael cannot go after Abigail uh I'm, I'm mixing up character names with actor names uh there's no reason why he couldn't just go after angel to like get her but he's like god why won't you let me and it's like what it's like is, are you a prophet now like i mean i guess hosea was but like what's going yeah. on you could just go uh and then they name drop free will which was a cringe out of me and it's just silly and it's not because i don't it's, i i just think the phrase itself is dead it's it's you've been killed killed it it's over um but like it's just strange. And so like, there's no character drama because there's so many like, like puppeteering things going on over these characters that prevents them from being able to be realized. Yeah. They're like, they're beholden to the source material to an extent. Like there's only so far, but I would also contend that if you're already making, like you already threw in the twist from old boy 
you already added an hour of this poor woman being horribly mistreated. Why not take cut off 30 minutes of that stuff and put 30 more minutes of in, just conversation? Yeah, of them getting to know each other. Like, they don't, them, why they don't, can't they walk? Why can't the scene when, like, you brought up the farming scene when they're cutting weeds, it, instead of making it so obvious of, like, you always got to cut weeds or something? Well, she it lampshades could be this it. conversation yeah, of, she like, she lampshades that. She's like, oh, could, not so subtle, huh? Yeah, uh, just and it's like it could have been a good it. conversation of like him refining himself or like I love the imagery that's used in scripture to describe us as plants that like we're uh, and it's consistent. <laughs> it's yes. like all the time we're trees, we're plants, we bear fruit. Like all that's wonderful. And like I wish I think it's specifically in a western uh culture that's suburbia or cities um you miss out on what makes that metaphor used in scripture so wonderful. So like to put that in a film of like a character farming and that's, that's why hidden life is so wonderful because there's so much farming. Um, <laughs> even in interviews with them, like Terrence Malick apparently just would like run the camera and just be like, okay, farm. And so they're just farming for like 40 minutes in the hot sun. And it's like, cause Malick doesn't know how to cut. Um, he just like, it like there's, he, I and, love uh, the interview we talked about someone mentioned he just becomes transfixed by the camera. And I was like, that's yeah. beautiful. Well, he'll like, and he'll like whisper like little things of like, go this way or move forward or move backward. And it's very cool quiet but like it keeps going and going and going uh so the the actors are literally just farming and tilling land oh you want a dinner tonight after the shoot well you just like, you gotta farm <laughs> you gotta earn uh, it you gotta earn it so uh, like um and there's so much beauty to be had there that they end up not doing like because to compare i don't i don't think it's unreasonable to compare to hidden life because there's similar imagery and stuff going on not the same plot at all but like in terms of like spirituality like the work of uh, the work of maintaining one's faith and persevering to to believing in love is like tilling the garden and like you're um uh there's a part in this film briefly when michael's uh using i don't know what the device is called he's plowing through the ground and it gets caught on a stone and like how that like judders the muscles and you have to now let go and like you have to be- realign everything like there's so much that goes into it um that like the movie never never slows down to like breathe you and, know it's and weird and process what's weird this movie yes i know there's never really a scene where she like at least to a like substantive extent like just tells him her story like there's yeah. never a scene with there's that like never happens He's like, oh, I know everything about you. You know, it's just like, and okay, it would be great to see him like struggle with that. Like, why isn't the that lack in the of movie? intimacy? Like, <laughs> I don't like. He's been patient in not having sex with anybody, and she's uh, been working sexually. Allegedly, thousands based on uh, uh, based on a line. Says. So, like yeah. the idea, like that's some good drama to explore of like him resisting and waiting or, and, and stuff like that. Drama where. Like, I was really hoping that because he's one of the higher build actors in the movie, that Logan Marshall Green would just be a character in the movie. And part of the drama is like their relationship with standing scrutiny and people criticizing him. Like, how can you how can you love her? How can you be faithful to her? She's been mm-hmm. so unfaithful, etc. Right. That's a movie, baby. <laughs> like that I is, thought that was going to be more of the film, right? And me then, too. Like, he's just like, go away. <laughs> and <I'm> like, oh, okay. <laughs> he throws one right problem. cross, and then it's over, and then, <laughs> and then they just leave. It's. I want my dinner scene. Dang it! In my drama movie, where they're all sitting together, and it's before anything's been revealed, and we in like, the audience, what, like it comes at night. <laughs> yeah it comes at night or, <laughs> or hereditary where yeah. they're like sitting at the table and like we as the audience are starting to go oh no upgrades had sex with with uh angel already oh before. like th- that seems to take like, place but they see sticks around and like uh. and they don't know it yet and like it's just this gross dynamic of uh drama and michael who it would add more like if you're gonna make a character a gary stew you're gonna make them the perfect character you then have to introduce forces against them, which there really isn't any. They're kind of Angel, well, but then Angel's the f- not there, so it doesn't matter. Well, so the like, idea to is have- that like, Angel, like her, the real antagonist is herself, getting in the way of herself. But yes, like, sure. 
you could have done like a cool dual narrative thing, right? Where you you cut you cut back to him on the farm, just waiting for her while she does all these things, as opposed to just she, she just leaves and the camera slash store movie stays with her, and we have no idea what Michael Hosea is doing. Allegedly, right? How does he process it? Does he go he, visit the bar and he's noticing and eyeballing yeah. other women, and then he goes home and feels bad about it? Like that would be good character building in contrast to like how the two react to yeah their or, bodies and sexuality you know, and things like that or if you just if right. or if he, if he has to be captain america the whole time you could <laughs> do the job thing or people come to him and are like uh, yeah man time for you to move on she left and it's just like no she's my wife i told you you know whatever. <laughs> and like then like and then like you know then when she comes back it hits harder because as far as i know he's just t-posing off screen somewhere like waiting to <laughs> yeah, waiting yeah, to activate yeah. again you know like if i can no clip out the film i'll see him just like standing there <laughs> right like uh, it's but then like you could and because the, the argument for that is like no because it's her story gosh darn it it's it's her story over oh, doing those things but it's just she just goes and does something bad and then first time michael shows up and just punches some people and she leaves and then the other time she runs she starts an orphanage off screen or whatever you know it's just like they weirdly fixate on all they they can't stop fixating on the most sultry and lurid aspects of the story which itself wouldn't be too bad if this was supposed to be like a you know john waters or david cronenberg movie or something (laughs) but like it's not yeah it's just it there's so much there's so much obvious stuff you could do that it's extremely to keep repeating the same thing over again it is it ba- it's baffling that none of that's on screen like why isn't there yeah why isn't there a scene where he where like they talk about everything she's gone through her life like is this that one thing at the end of the movie where she finally gives him her name because it's the one thing she could control it's the one thing she could keep to herself as everyone took some of the other things from her which is a beautiful wonderful idea that is a heartbreaking detail that doesn't happen because it's not really mentioned throughout the movie like it, sh- it should have been throughout the- there's one scene earlier where he's like what's your real name and she's just like ah, it doesn't matter my name's angel you know whatever and like what this could have been a recurring thing throughout the film or something and it's well, just intimacy not- and ownership could have been a recurring thing and it never really is um, yeah because then it just I hard cuts an- to them like laughing and giggling while while farming and apparently everything's great yeah. and then it just cuts to her not happy again you know it's just oh, with music with music that is modern music too which i thought was really strange i really like oh they should um, have like bluegrass hymns and stuff right <laughs> yeah well they kind of do yeah. the one song in the middle and i really like that and movies where the music is in the setting and then becomes part of the film i really enjoy uh but they don't do that and two times they just play modern country songs it's just really strange songs that can be about anything and frankly are about any spirituality (laughs) but because they Mm. play with four chords and Mm -hmm. it has the build-up it's a it's a christian song but uh yeah the film's really not i think there's an argument that some people who like the film would say it's a film about like um individual sovereignty and your own body uh being part of that and ownership and so like part of her exploring Part of her being her character as a prostitute is her like having ownership of herself um, in spite of the fact that other people are like owning her. Um, And then the film could be a transformation of like, no, but actually what I'm doing isn't ownership of myself. Um, It's like debasing myself or something. Self-harm, really, yeah, because she's depressed. So it's like, I'll just do something that is nothing. Uh, Makes me think of nothing as most um, sex addiction functions, but like then it's just, but then the movie really isn't about that because it's not exploring any of those details with any of the other characters. If it had been exploring that with other characters, that would have been interesting. Um, Like did, did upgrade have sex with her before or after his wife died? That would introduce a dynamic of drama to his character. Um, That would also introduce a dynamic of like, uh, individual choices and and like self sovereignty that kind of thing that like um, is not introduced in the film and so it's just like it's like a collection of scenes put together that arguably make a film uh, but it's just not um, a particularly detailed or depthy film like I can't pick out details about it to 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 draw on a theme or anything that's substantial. Um, <clears throat> 
I always make references and comparisons to whatever's going on in my life. And I'm playing, of course, the Ark of Night game. And like, there is a theme of, in, of multi- self multiplication of like the Batman and the Ark of Night are basically the same characters solving their own different primary problems. There's a whole Joker thing about multiple Jokers going on. And so every little plot line is different versions. Even the side quest, the fact that Man Bat's finally in it, thank you, Lord, um, is more Batman. Yeah, like this is great. Um, and so there's a consistent theme throughout used in every module within the media and then redeeming love. I know I compared to wild, wild comparisons. Let's, uh, let's start comparing to Godfather next, but like, um, there's no consistent, there's just not that in this film where each character is maybe a different module to represent the same concept. Um, if anything, it's just a different module for a Christian film to be a bit more, sexy like you said i think that's a sexy christian movie <laughs> like that's just which is inherently funny to think yeah. um well i think uh, it, next thing we'll get like i think it's a violent and slasher christian you can't movie. and you can't it's blame like, you go and watch this trailer they're marketing it it's very similar to the trailer for serenity actually which is funny because neither movie uh, is the movie yeah. that's in the trailer this but it's a video game yeah, this is a video, <laughs> yeah which isn't a thing he says in the movie that's just what i say every time i watch the movie i know but that's um, what it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's but like they're marketing it like a sexy a christian sultry movie. <laughs> this is a sexy christian movie uh matthew mcconaughey watching trailers um <laughs> yeah no it's it's they're clearly marketing it as such but like like st- strip away everything for a second like this is supposed Ha-ha! to be a story okay. strip away everything <laughs> okay Bazinga. all right it's a, it's, a, it's a classy show um <laughs> This is supposed to be a story about God's unfailing love for his people. This is supposed to be a story about despite how far we drift and how far we run away from God, he is still faithful and he still loves us. And it kind of succeeds at that in the most broadest sense that at the end of the movie, they're together as a couple. But like there are so many better ways to illustrate that through the actual character actions which it trips over itself it really trips over itself like so so hard just and like just like angel the film is its own enemy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah that's true i yeah we could sit here and talk about all different ways because yeah it could be like well they had to do this this and this because that's in the story and it because that's in the original trust me no text. movie ever has to do certain things yeah there well, are yeah, so first, many things so, in this film yeah. that i was like this could have been shorter you could have trimmed this you could have cut that you could have it's just it was wild, dude. I'd love yeah. to see the cutting room floor. What did not make it into this film? One one detail Man that alive. I really, really hated that never brought up again is early in the movie when you see him praying. He's praying in a little chapel by himself. And I don't know if the implication is that he's the only faithful guy in town. If that's just a Baby, chapel, he built hundreds himself. of guys are lining up to the brothel. I don't yeah, know. it's just it, there's the literally lined up outside going, hoo, hoo, ha, you know, waiting to see one person. When the movie started, I was just surprised because <laughs> of how overt it was with all those details yeah but which again that doesn't necessarily bother me but like it never comes again like i was like there should be a scene where like he takes her to the chapel and he teaches her how to pray or they read the bible together and maybe one of the men who also is there praying is someone who was with her like that could be interesting where's the broader dynamics of this film or yeah or you know what just go full full hog they start sharing the gospel of town and the fact that this woman who was once known as a prostitute has been transformed by the love of god is a testimony to everyone in the town that's something baby right or <laughs> or i've slept with your pastor something crazy like that <laughs> i mean i guess i don't think what this movie needs there is more are like two weird sides lurid there drama. are two sides like, to every coin you're like i don't like the fact that there's mild nudity but they should have more sex in the movies as well it have some sort of theme this movie has nothing and so like if it wanted to maybe well there's no be drama a, for a drama a there's period. very little drama right i mean it could have a period piece modern exploration of sex problems in the church now like that would be really interesting but the film i think that might be a little out of the movie's grasp <laughs> to, to be I, honest well the movie is out of its own grasp but so, it's just i, I don't I, think more ambition is what the movie I, I if anything i'm trying to i'm trying to lower the scope like okay like it doesn't need to be this grand multi-year because this movie actually takes place over like four years which i like flashbacks. that's a trope i like i think that's it's, great if you're trying to work through 
drama, if, character drama. It's great. It, if we got more like extended, because the thing, like the Bible doesn't specify how long these Hosea excursions is. are. So like it could be a it thing. It had to at least be 9, 18, 20. It had to be 9 times 3, 27. It had to be at least 27 months. So like you could have a thing where she, three kids. <laughs> as she runs away, right? Like the, each time she runs away, it could take place over a longer period of time. But like also the time they spend together can also be long. So it's like, so it makes sense because what we have is like a marriage that we actually don't know how long they're together. It doesn't seem like a lot of time. It's not a lot of screen time because they spend so little time together on screen. But the sequences where she's gone are 90% of the movie. Yes. So like it creates a sense where like they don't feel like a couple at all. And it's really bad yeah. for your romance drama movie when the thing that doesn't really make any sense or work is the core of the film, you know, it's weird. It's weird. It's weird. What is this movie about? I just want to know what it's about. <laughs> it's about redeeming. It's right there in the title. It's redeeming. It's love. not though. <laughs> it's barely. I didn't say it's successful. I'm saying that's what the movie I is know. in theory about. Is I know. This is a redeeming love. <laughs> 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 Doesn't he sound like Matthew McConaughey in the movie, though? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know. I guess I haven't watched enough Matthew McConaughey to know. Well, it's, it sounds like he's doing an impression of like a good old boy, which is inevitably kind of sounds like Matthew McConaughey. I thought Upgrade was just imitating every character in Walking Dead because he was doing the head turns and stuff. <laughs> so, Melvin, would you recommend Redeeming Love? Not at all. I, I, oh well, I don't know. I, I <laughs> actually kind of loved it. <laughs> <laughs> we keep talking. I'll start liking it. Um. Which is not un- unheard of. There are film- plenty of films I've seen. Both Panos Cosmatos movies did not like when I first saw them, and then I ended up falling in love with them. So whatever. Um, no, I don't know. I by the time you've listened to this, which is literally, literally tomorrow, um, there's probably more better movies that have come out <laughs> in one day. I guess um, I just watched it to kill twenty, to kill some more time, and have more stuff on the rank list. We watched it together because we didn't know what to do this week, and it's not like we both had time to run out to the movies, and this was on Peacock, so why not? Um, If you're just curious, you might as well watch it. I think we were kind of expecting to have a subset discussion about David A.R. White. Like, what is his I don't think he was very involved in this movie. I can't imagine, but I know he does a lot of stuff with Universal. That's who distributes some of his films, most of them. Um, is it universal? I think this is a universal. Yes. Yeah. Because it it's why it's not Yeah. Um. So I I don't know. I, I there's not even really anything to learn about who's producing the movie because it seems like I don't know where Eddie Wood's faith is in this film, but like, uh, it doesn't seem like anyone except for Francine Rivers, who probably wasn't even super involved in this film either, uh, has some form of faith because it I doesn't would, breathe. Through. I would like to hear her feeling on the movie. I'm actually kind of good. fascinated with how this movie came together. I would like to know more about it. Um, so the film isn't, I don't know, horrible. It won't make you hate anything about the film itself. It's just confusing. And I don't know, like there's a scene towards the end where like, it's literally like neon demon where our protagonist is in one room hearing other girls being assaulted in the other room. And in this film, it's minors. So it's like really 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 hard to watch at times and it's made harder because of itself um because there's plenty of films like we've mentioned that we've seen that are hard in terms of content and not nearly as difficult to engage so i don't know this movie's weird that's really all i could say (laughs) i just i don't know if i'd recommend it or don't recommend it if you're like me and you're just trying to fill out a rank list and you just want something else to be at the bottom, you could check this one out. But why bother? Yeah, it's it's a it's curiosity. Too long. That's, no, don't watch it. It's two hours and 14 minutes. It's too long. Yeah, I would say it's so but it's so long that's hard to recommend it even as like a like a novelty. Cause the I the whole premise the whole pitch of like this is a Christian film, but it is a little more sexually explicit than most Christian films, but it's also kind of gets a pass because it's based on a biblical thing, kind of is if you have a kind of um if you kind of have a strong stomach for that sort of thing and everything we've said just makes you kind of curious maybe but it is it's an investment of your time that i just don't know if it's worth it 
for what you would get out of it. So it makes it extremely hard for me to recommend even to like a faith-based audience. Cause if, if all you've watched is Christian faith-based entertainment, this is definitely going to really, really be more than what you're used to in terms of content. Like that's partially what's so interesting. Cause one of the people I talked to someone who I specifically talked in person to somebody who watched this film and they watched it with like a group of like people from like church people who went to see it together and they mentioned they're like some people genuinely had difficulty watching some of the stuff in the movie. And it's probably because th- this, my assumption is that these are people who they don't go to the movies a lot. They don't watch a lot of television shows like, you know, and so this is really radical compared to what they're used to. So, yeah, that would have been an interesting segment. Was there any thoughts, you know, from like in broader terms, like how they felt about it? Like, cause I, 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 I saw in letterbox, most people were upset with, um, they felt that the film was a cultural, uh, a Christian cultural response to like slut shaming and stuff. Um, they were really upset with her lack of agency. Um, I don't, I don't they think they didn't that's like fair. the idea of it. They didn't like the idea of the protagonist saving her all the time and that she couldn't save herself. Um, and I think some of that stuff is reasonable, uh, especially when looking more metatextually. I mean, even the fact that the ending is just Pizzagate and it's just like, <laughs> Like it's period piece pizza gate. Like that's just weird. Uh, it's like hitting all these weird, ba- like, like baselines of Christianity, Christian culture, which I'd not, which is not necessarily Christianity that just feels strange to me. Um, and people on letterbox were very aware of those things. Uh, and that's why they're it's getting... a weird thing just to kind of have in there. That's not explored in any way. And it's not know? really like, like they set it up as an antagonist figure. And then like, it's like an hour later and then you see them again in a flashback. Who's just there. That was hilarious. He's just always places. She is, which as a metaphor for the devil, like, okay, that makes more sense. But He's also not. He's just a human being. So. Which would have worked better if Arkham Knight reference again. Yeah. If it was like Joker and it was just in her head. And like they kind of do that with a nightmare scene where it's like the past is affecting her presently, which would make sense because that would at least build a theme of like if you're trying to think about of redemption and yeah, he's like Kilgrave and, and Jessica Jones, kind of where he's yeah. almost like he's supernatural in nature. Yeah, but, come back, Angel. Like, yeah. just like you got to do stuff like that. Um, but Which, they don't really do that. Better job of exploring some of the themes. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think, Not like, whenever Jesus I watch Christian films show. that aren't necessarily good, I always think, like, what's something else that would be better in its exploring those themes <laughs> to watch? <laughs> Jessica Jones season one. 100% but better at exploring way more themes. explicit way more appropriate yes <laughs> if this movie better. was a little too much then man oh man yeah it's it's strange in that way what was i say yeah i don't think some of those i think some of those criticisms are kind of fair if you remove the everything in the movie where like the story that they're adapting even as loose as it may be is intrinsically that it is about like a man is symbolizing, you know, God and Israel. So it's, it's, you can't really divorce that from the story. Correct. I think there's a better way to portray it. And again, by only focusing on those lurid details, you inadvertently kind of step into that conversation. Like, okay. Yeah. It's a little, little old fashioned, but I mean, it's literally out of the Old Testament. So, I mean, well, I think the, the problem with it being "quote unquote" old fashioned is that it doesn't have characters. She yes. has no agency. If Which, she had drama and agency, then that would have been great. Because then he doesn't turn into the character that saves her. He turns into the foundation character. That's like whenever she needs something or she wants to be better, she can return. And like, I think there was some implication of wanting to try to do that with him being like, I can't. I, I can't do it. Why God, why can't I go do it? Uh, she needs to come back. Uh, but like, because she doesn't come, like even the way they get married doesn't feel like her choice. She's like half beaten to death. It's like the only option to get out of here is to get married. Yeah. Um, and like, I didn't necessarily like that as a character choice or as a narrative choice. So like, I get that, but, but I was curious. Optimal. Like, yeah. yeah awesome. uh, what a good word. Yeah. I'll just say <laughs> that. Many things that were not optimal. But 
what what about like did you hear much in terms of christian responses to it like you had that one friend group who went to see if, it but like <laughs> as is always the case with most faith-based movies except for one recently that have just been better like the aforementioned keys for christ and i can only imagine um in classic pure flicks tradition critical reception presented to rotten tomatoes like 12 and then audience ratings like a 95 because so, the christian review mob because it's just weird yeah so Christians tend, and I don't want to just paint with too broad a strokes here, but they, they, again, there tends to be this mentality of like, well, it's just being realistic. So that's the story you got to tell. But I think even in this case, I think it's some, not realistic. some people have <laughs> some issues with, with some of the, the material, but like overall, because the movie ends on the note it does, it's pretty palatable to a lot of people because of that. I, I would again I would like to do a little more canvassing as far as this goes. I'd also like to read let's read some of the people's reviews. I know um another Christian movie podcast already did this movie. So I would maybe like to listen to their uh review, see Pop what they Theo. thought. Go check it out. Popcorn Theology. Um I'd I'd want to I'd kinda of be I'd be very interested in hearing what their thoughts were. And I don't know, maybe maybe send them our episode, see how they uh see how it matches up. But yeah. Uh it's i mean we're still talking about the movie for all its faults we just can't we we were literally winding down but we find ourselves once again talking about this thing because it's such a it is so it's unique and i think some of its uniqueness will help it stand out like it wouldn't surprise me if people were still talking about this movie years from now because it is such a anomaly Did you see that christian movie with the side boobs in it well Did like, you see it it's just like, like that's the movie but like the whole thing with the agency it's, it's not just an agency. It's a character. She doesn't have one. Neither neither right. of the two main characters really are much of characters. So it's hard Which to you could give. argue is more objectifying to have a character who has no character be more naked throughout the film. She it's, Yeah, because you, you run into a thing where purposefully or not, you just have a character who exists to get beaten up and then not get beaten up, which... You know, which like is I like said, the big criticism is, of like certain films with their female depiction, which is this woman dies naked in the slasher film so like that's, why did you do that like what was the purpose right. of that what's the purpose of it other than some man gawking at the naked body of a woman and then triggering the sad fight or flight thing because she's also dead like that's kind of this movie but like that that's probably why the first 40 minutes is so so much more offensive and bothersome to me than other films can be because at least in those movies it's quicker <laughs> it doesn't last forever yeah um and then this one it's like Let's explore every form of violence against women. And then like, even when like the, there's the implied abortion scene, like my wife was just surprised because it's sort of just out of nowhere. Yeah. And it's does not need to be, you could, for me, the line into when something becomes exploitive is when you can get the exact same like uh, response or results doing something another way. And you choose to do the way that is easier or just more shocking to me, that's when you kind of get into exploitive territory. And I think the movie, again, I don't know the behind the scenes. I don't know what their intention was, but I think they've kind of drifted into a borderline exploitation where you just yeah. think you give horrible things to do to her and why not do it? I, again, I don't know. The first if, Christian exploitation film. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Because I... <laughs> There's lots of other movies and television shows and stuff that have the same premise and setting that just aren't this. So, you know, I don't know. It's 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 getting a lot of feelings and thoughts out of me, though. So, I mean, that's something that's more than a lot of other movies you talked about. It's more than some Marvel movies we've talked about, frankly. <laughs> yeah. So. so, yeah, it just. I, th I really think some of this comes down to the choice of director, which I have nothing personal against this person or anything. I just don't think they have the subtle touch that was necessary to handle the subject matter. Like, I think just literally switching it up to uh, almost, I don't know, I don't say anyone, but like finding somebody who can handle the subject matter in a more tasteful way would have ch really transformed the movie in a lot of ways. I genuinely feel that way. Because yeah. the same person also did was a co-writer on, on the screenplay. So he had a quite a bit of influence in a lot of what we saw on screen. So I think that would have really changed a lot. But I'm also just making assumptions. So Reco or no Reco, 
Uh, generally, no. But I think if if you're really into Christian films, like as a curiosity, because I know some people just the same way they're really into like Juggalo culture, or they're watching, <laughs> they're watching if you're all a those Juggalo. It, <laughs> let me tell you, or you're watching, you love. like you just can't stop watching all those direct to video Bruce Willis or John Cusack films because or whatever. Like if you some people view Christian pure flux type entertainment the same way. This is up there, not just in terms of like interesting choice of subject matter, but also because like it is much more well made than a lot of those movies. It's much more well made than all those Bruce Willis direct to video movies where mm-hmm. he's in fifteen minutes of them. Um and but I also would say that is I really can't recommend it over just reading the book, which I have not read, but I can assume is better, or just reading the story of Hosea. It's right there in the Minor Prophets. Uh just go and check that out instead. So mostly no recommendation except for you know who you are <laughs> sure. to this person yes. you can't wait to watch it after listening to us babble about it for an hour and a half it's or, definitely or if you want to have your own about. opinion because yes. you've said a lot of strong opinions in this episode so certainly yes. if you will have a different experience watching it or you feel that way i'm not going to stop you i won't go and unplug everyone's device that they get peacock on or anything it's a free country you know much like hosea <laughs> letting gomer Go start a school where they teach women how to typewrite. I will <laughs> not. I will let you make that decision for yourself. I just wish they were named not my children. <laughs> it would have been great. <laughs> the one kid walks out. Hey, Edward Nigma. <laughs> well, no, they, they have the name. one kid. Uh, also, there's so much stuff you could do. <sighs> I, oh my gosh, we need to stop talking. But I, I wish, I wish they had a scene where they were like getting to know each other. And Michael Hosea was just like, oh, I come from a long family. You know, I'm the son of Beery, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz. <laughs> <And just> like, <laughs> you do a lineage? Yeah. Uh, that would have been great. I was like, come on. Where's, 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 you know, Shane Black or whoever to do some punch up writing in there to get some jokes in the movie? Uh, what kind of recommendations do you have for this episode? Oh, sure boy. Um, oh, ASMR. Here we go again. Uh. As some of you may know, Hosea is in the Bible. Uh, it is one of the minor prophets. And so I'm just going to recommend real quick two commentaries that, on the minor prophets that I quite really enjoy. The first is James Montgomery Boyce's uh, The Minor Prophets, Volume 1. Obviously, you get Volume 2, but Volume 1 includes Hosea. Uh, I love James Montgomery Boyce. He is one of the greatest commentators of all time. His contributions as both a pastor and writer are sorely missed. Uh, I also believe I've recommended this before, but it's an incredible budget commentary on the Old Testament. Uh, But if you get the Preacher's Commentary, Volume 23, Walter Kaiser Jr., who is one of the foremost uh, theologians when it comes to Old Testament stuff. He also wrote like hard sayings of the Bible and those sorts of books. Uh, He wrote one on all of the minor prophets. So if these volumes are only like maybe 15, 20 dollars. Uh, but in his case, he get he he his packs a lot of punch for a relatively small uh, commentary. So I recommend uh, those uh, Walter Kaiser Jr.'s Minor Prophets. Actually, I think I, sorry, I think Volume Twenty Two is the one that uh, has his stuff in it. But yeah, those are my recommendations for that. Uh, also, I'll just throw this one in there too. Ugh. Ugh. I think uh, Peter Craig, his 12 prophets from the daily Bible study series is solid. Uh, I know that the daily Bi- study Bible series, because uh, the new Testament set is of course written by William Barclay. I know he's not everyone's favorite for a variety of reasons, but uh, I actually really enjoyed this one and getting like finding a volume, just like on Hosea, for example, as like a fool's errand. It's just extremely hard to do that because so many will just throw just all the minor prophets in one commentary because no one's gonna release a commentary in just like an eight chapter like small minor prophet on its own so i mean in general you could also just get like an old testament commentary that covers everything but uh what is your what is your recommendation melvin oh my gosh uh dairy girls i the second i saw uh man i'm gonna get her name right uh jamie lee o'donnell in in the movie I was like, ah, oh, man, I got to get back to finishing that because I'm in season two. It is so freaking funny. Um, it's on Netflix. It's amazing. Uh, it's, coming, it's coming back for season three soon. 
Uh, so you have watched it? No. What? <laughs> it's so funny. It's so good. I've been meaning to ask you about it because it's like, it's great. It's so freaking good. Um, you may want to watch with subtitles because gosh darn it, these accents are thick and it's really, really tough sometimes. In fact, my my parents love the show and they're going to rewatch it with subtitles because they want to get more jokes because sometimes it just goes right over their head. Um, it is just hilarious. Um, the premise is a bunch of uh, young girls, and I think um, I think it's a cousin, the, a guy. They all go to an all girls school, including the guy, um, and they're in Ireland. Uh, and it's during the Troubles. It's a great backdrop for satire. Um, they specifically don't like the guy because he's British. It's great. It's super super funny. It's really coarse. Um, it's never really inappropriate at all. It's in terms of uh, dialogue, it could be. But it is one of the funniest shows in the world. Um, me with the comparisons, um, Star Trek as a show all, is at its best when characters, when the characters get into a situation where you go, how is it possible that they get out of it? Obviously, you know they get out of it because there's like seven more seasons of the show you're watching. Uh, Dairy Girls is the reverse, where you're always going to question, how did they get into this situation? <laughs> Um, whatever the episode starts with, it is never, ever going to be how it ends. Um, it'll be referenced because the show always ties everything together. But like, as you keep watching, it just mounts up and up with like comedic situations and stuff. The first episode is just amazing. It's so funny. Um, 100% recommend it. Uh, great performances, great comedy. Uh, cannot wait for another season, even though I'm still in season two. You got to check it out. So Dairy Girls, go watch it. Go watch that instead of instead of Redeeming Love. It is so much better. What's your, what's your fun recommendation, Dan? Uh, first off, I have to uh, mention that the Preacher's Commentary, uh, Volume 22, is not written by Walter Kaiser. I do recommend Volume 23, but uh, the same volume for the same set is good. It's Walter Kaiser to not author it. Apologies. Uh, so I'm recommending both of those, but also... Uh, for my quote unquote fun recommendation, although this is not very fun, uh, I'm going to recommend a book. It is written by, uh, let me just make sure I get this. It is in my native tongue, but still the uh, Toshi Kazu Kawaguchi. Um, celebrated author in Japan, not necessarily made a huge splash in the States outside of just like book people. Uh, however, he recently wrote a book called Before the Coffee Gets Cold, a novel. And you don't know this when you start reading it, but it's allegedly part of a series. The second book is supposed to re- uh, release soon, uh, less than a year from now. But Before the Coffee Gets Cold is this wonderful little book. It's sort of an anthology about a coffee shop where if you sit down at a particular table, order and drink coffee, you can briefly go back in time specifically to another time previously in that coffee shop. And the only caveat is you have to get back before your coffee gets cold or else you'll be stuck. And so it's all these little vignettes and, and stories where people go back and everyone has their own reason for uh, going, wanting to go back. And a lot of the characters of the various stories are characters you previously see in the other stories because they're all regulars at this coffee shop. It's a neat That's little cool. book. It's some of the stories in Japanese literature tends to be extremely melancholy and tug at your heartstrings and some of the stories in this book are sad i'm not gonna i'm not gonna uh you know bury the lead here but it's it's such a unique book and it's really easy to read it's small and because of its anthology format it's pretty easy to get through and there's also a second volume coming out soon which i like i said it's well worth a read it's heartbreaking it makes you appreciate life it's beautiful and it's affecting in a way that not a lot of other recent books are. So that is my recommendation. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once a month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. 
Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.